you guys are making the first step to get grant funds in your new home buying journey. I'm Monica Trudeau. I'm the broker with Realty One Group Universal. And I'm Mike Frank. I'm with EXP Realty. I have a small team that you guys might have seen out there with Frank Oliver and Company. Okay. He has an amazing team. He says small, but it is. So <laughs> you guys know how this, you, you've already written your contract. And then after the contract, there's a lot of important factors that happen. So what we're going to do is Push the slides here. Do we, do we need to turn the lights down? You think you, you guys are okay seeing that? Okay. So you all know that a contract is an agreement between you, both the buyer and the seller, to purchase a home. So you signed your contract, you've been out with your real estate agent, you saw a couple houses, you saw too many houses, and you're like, this is the one that feels like home to me. You signed the contract, and so you've agreed to um, to be in a binding agreement. What we're going to go to learn today is the step between signing a contract and closing. What typically happens at the closing table, that's where all the fun happens. Why each step in the process is important and tips to help you along the way. After the contract is signed, dun, dun, it gets really nervous at this point. So you're signing the contract, and you're like, yes, I want this house. I'm super excited. But then you realize that you just signed a really, really legal agreement. So we're going to tell you a little bit more about that. And then. So we call this on our team the due diligence period. And the very first thing that happens after you sign the contract, you're going to do your home inspection. A home inspection is bringing a licensed inspector, typically not your dad, right? <laughs> oh, You're going to bring someone who actually has knowledge and license, and we're going to schedule with that person as well as the seller, because we do need permission from the seller to tour the property. And the inspector is going to examine what they call the structural and mechanical systems of the home. If you buy a house on a well or a septic, or maybe you guys consider getting a specialty certification, like a roof certification, or uh, for those of us that might have concerns with mold or anything else, that's all going to fall during our inspections period, and we're going to learn about the home. I think the biggest key to take away about home inspection, and this is the misnomer that maybe your parents or other people that have bought a home, they would renegotiate after the home inspection. That's not what this is intended for. It's intended to say, hey, this is the home that you love. Let's learn about it and make sure that we can really feel comfortable living there, right? It's not designed to say, oh, there's a roofing problem, let's knock 10 grand off the roof. It's designed to say, there's a roofing problem, let's fix it so that I can love where I live, right? I think, um, you have anything to add on inspections? Just, just to keep in mind that the, in addition to everything that he said, the inspection is, um, it's an opinion. So inspectors are licensed, but it's still their opinion. So you have to keep that in mind when you're making a decision to either ask for repairs once I can move forward in the process is that, you know, is, is fixing a water leak that's something that I can just put, you know, some piping on. Is that really important to me? Is it worth me possibly losing the property? Um, or, you know, just maybe, like he said, he mentioned the roof. Maybe the roof is something that we do want to negotiate. So it is a matter of opinion from the inspector's, pers um, I mean, from the uh, home inspector's perspective, but it's there, they're there just to help you not just find things wrong with the house. Like people go and say, oh my gosh, it's the home inspection. I want to know everything that's wrong, but you're going to learn. You got to learn that you have to change your filter. You got to learn how the water system works or, you know, how the well works. And two big things when it comes to opinion, two things that you should know. One, your home inspection is kind of like a snapshot in time. It's today. Well, it's raining today, right? But tomorrow, that water that might be leaking might present itself. That home inspector is only there for three hours. So I encourage my clients to lean on their inspector and say, hey, I just moved into my house. You told me we had a good roof. Now I have a leak. What do I do? Not, oh my God, let's go sue the seller because that's not realistic, but more lean back on the professional that you use to say, hey, what's your opinion now, right? The other thing is your real estate agent should help you understand the inspections process. Monica's great, I'm awesome, we're different. It doesn't make us right or wrong, 
but my perspective on a small electrical issue might terrify you. And it's like, my opinion should be important, your opinion should be important, because that's how we're going to protect you in the process. Absolutely. And you had a question, sir? Yeah, I was uh, wondering, uh, shouldn't the inspection be before signing the contract? Oh, good question. That is a great question. Okay. So, uh, in other states, and certainly in Maryland a long time ago, that was a commonality. There are buyers that will pay for an inspection prior to submitting an offer. But if you were to inspect every house before you submitted an offer, you'd get in a little bit over your head just on the cost of the inspection. So the way that we do it today, think of it this way. I love this house. I want to buy it. Now I'm having an inspection to make sure that I still want to buy it. Instead of looking at it like my inspection will tell me what to pay for it, that's not a realistic expectation. And there are deals that will fall apart because there's a leaky roof or a major electrical problem. That is a reality. But what I always tell my clients is if the seller says no, are you prepared to walk away from this deal at this price? And you should be able to say yes or no, not renegotiate. Does that make sense? And sometimes there is room for negotiation, but not major negotiation, like changing the terms of the initial contract that you signed. Negotiations in the event that the seller is out of town and they really want to fix the heating system, so they may decide to give you a seller contribution in lieu of making the repair themselves. That type of negotiation, but not changing the you know immediate terms of the contract. Right, and a big thing for negotiation when the seller would issue you that credit, a lot of people think like, oh, let me save $5,000 on the sale of the home. Does anybody know how much that's gonna save them month to month if the seller was to take $5,000 off the sale of the home? 20 bucks. 20 bucks. So are you gonna be able to fix that $5,000 repair with $20 a month? It's not helping you to lower the price. We need that contribution to help actually make that material fix. I got that? Great question. One program might be better than the other. The appraisal. A lot of people get this mixed up. The appraisal versus the home inspection. They're two different items in your process at the contract. So your appraisal is when your, lend, your, your, your lender orders the appraisal. So and the appraisal is to determine the value of the house. So you sign this contract for $300,000. The appraiser wants to come out and make sure that the house is really worth $300,000. Because keep in mind, sellers can list their properties for whatever they want to. They don't have to listen to what their real estate agent or the comp say. They can put whatever price they want on it. But when you purchase it using financing, it has to be worth what you're willing to pay for or what your contract says you're paying for it. So, again, they assess the property, what it's worth. And quick tip, make sure the appraiser is familiar with the local market and has access to accurate data. But that's where you come in working with a good professional real estate agent. Because I know for me personally, whether it's my buyer or my seller, I'm always doing comps on whatever property it is. So the appraiser may have an opinion of what the value is, but if you have factual data to back it up, then it, you know you guys will be in alignment. Yeah, the other thing is to understand that your appraisal kind of supports your investment. Think of it that way. If you're gonna invest 180, 250, $400,000 into something, you wanna know that someone not you, not your dad, not your real estate agent, but an independent third party is giving you a valuation that supports that sales price. Absolutely. So the appraiser is designed to be that person. I will forewarn you and caution you that appraisers are kind of like God in the real estate world. They hold all the cards in their hand. So trust your real estate agent that they're gonna guide you through this process because we're kind of, uh, buckling up when the appraisal happens. Yes, we are. <laughs> it's, it's much of a, we really hope that the appraiser sees the value that we see. But what happens if the appraiser doesn't see that value? What happens then? Right. Uh, it seems like uh, once you sign a contract, that's not binding. Because if, after you sign a contract, you do all these things for the appraisals and inspections. Yeah. You can't, can you well, opt out of it to deal? Well, think of it this way. It's due diligence. So if everything lines up with exactly what we thought, we're good. But if this happens, then that happens. 
So if the appraisal comes in short, which is what we call it, the appraisal comes in short, there's an opportunity to renegotiate the price. Okay. If, they, if you can't come to an agreement, you can get out of the contract. If this happens, then that. But you don't have the unilateral right to terminate. Cautious with that term, right? You don't have that very often. But are contracts like standard copy paste jobs, or are they each unique to the sale? They're pretty thick. So there is a Maryland standard form, but every property and every financial situation and every terms and agreements can be very different. And I was about to say, I taught another class um, before this, and which goes through the steps of the contract. I was hoping you guys may have already done that because it would give you more clarity that when you write a contract, these are contingencies. These are things that it's contingent upon. It's contingent upon the home inspection. It's satisfactory home inspection. It's contingent upon the house appraising for what you willing to pay for it. It's contingent upon you having all your cash to close. It's contingent upon your financing going through. And that's a whole other class, but those are great questions. So no, it's not copy and paste because each one's, each person's situation is unique. Different answer. Yes. It's just that simple. <laughs> the difference though is, and this is a true story. This is a true story. I was working with an agent who, from the public outlay, looks super successful. They call themselves a global real estate brand. They have agents in three states. They're a team leader. Okay. Well, the Maryland contract is pretty self-explanatory. It's copy and paste. So we put the contract together and she demands a document. It's one specific document and it doesn't matter what it is. And I said, that document's not required. And she says, my broker requires it. It happens all the time. And I said, it's not required. And she said, it's required. And so my administrator said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, then let's send it like this, which the way that we sent it saved my buyer $4,000. And I told the buyer when we signed the document, this is unconventional, it's not normal, I don't expect this to work, we could get all the way to settlement, and then this could be a problem, I want you to be prepared that we're gonna renege this document at a later date. And my buyer said, okay, okay. but if we don't, I say $4,000, and I said, yep. That's because I understand the documentation better than the other agent. And the other agent had their seller sign. So at settlement, my buyer pulled me aside and said, hey, did they ever say anything about this 4,000? And I went, no, that's why your closing costs are 8,000 and not 12,000. And he was like, cool. Exactly, and that's, that's the increase Cynthia I was talking about. Like, it, they're very different, but yeah, yeah. You know, there's a Merlin form where we fill in the blanks, but yeah. we only fill in the blanks that pertain to you and whatever you're looking to have in your contract. Because it's so simple, it might seem like, oh, real estate agent just fills in the blanks, and I do agree with that. I actually think that our job is super simple. But the understanding of what blanks to fill in and what documents to include and what contingencies to allow for and what contingencies not to allow for, it's all how you construct an offer. And for fairness, that's the difference between two agents. Yep. Did you have a question back there? Yeah, just, uh, <clears throat> just kind of a little to the side of this all. The, the appraisal and the, uh, um, and the inspection. So when I'm, when, when I'm looking online and looking at different house prices and everything, and I'm watching a particular house, and I'm seeing the price, they keep lowering the price and everything. Is that because they're going through this process and people, people are backing out, so it's lower, so they're lowering the price Again, or you, you can, but not necessarily. You can, sure. Not at all. Not I was really. just texting with a client. He's a repeat client of mine. I've worked with him a number of times before. And there's a property that just had a $15,000 price drop. And that seems great. And he says, well, why do you think they dropped the price? Mm -hmm. It's a simple reason. It's because they're marketing. It's a difference of two agents. The way that they've chosen to market this home has indicated that the value is less than what they're listing it for and he turned around and said to me well I think you could sell this for 450,000 and I said I completely agree with you and he said maybe I should buy it for 415,000 because it keeps dropping in price and I said I agree yeah. it's it's two different agents are doing two different marketing activities which is why it's really important who you choose to represent you on the buy side 
or the sell side. But something to keep in mind is that an appraisal is specific to that, uh, oftentimes it's that buyer client. So even if the seller had the property appraised and it says, recently appraised for 240,000, you go in and offer 240,000 and the appraisal comes in at 235. Well, but we had an older, it doesn't matter. Your appraisal, specific to you, specific to your lender, specific to your file. It's your third party person that's protecting you, not the seller's third party person that's supposed to protect the buyer. And I want to throw this out because I know we all are in a digital era. And so when you're looking on sites like Zillow, Redfin, those are not appraisals. Those are estimates. And keep in mind that sites like that, specifically Zillow, which we love it, but you know, Zillow is a marketing site. So they pull information from everywhere. It's not always fact. An assessment and appraisal are two different things. I get calls all the time. Oh, it says this house is worth, you know, three hundred thousand. I'm like, where did it say it? Assessment three hundred. That is a very different different term than appraisal. Again, appraisal is the third party comes in, and how appraisal determine can determine the price is they look at other properties in the same area that are similar to that one, that's part of it, that are similar to that one, they look at the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, you know, whether it's a new roof, the number of square footage is huge, and that's how it's determined. So, an appraisal that came in at 315 in January could be very different than an appraisal in March because multiple houses could have sold in between that time, and the market could have just changed. So it changed the determination that the appraisal would have given out. This is really key, that your appraiser is familiar with the local market. Right. You as buyers don't have a lot of control over that. We as agents have some, but limited. Um, the value here might be if we were to get a call from the appraiser that said, hey, um, can you send me comparable home values? Absolutely. I would love to do that for you. Even if you might be a, an expert in the market, our support can help them really enhance the value that they're substantiating their appraisal for. So, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Are you listening to the lender or the realtor or the appraisal? Which one? So, you, which one is the buyer? Which one is important to you? The buyer? buyer? Yes. Well, you're building a team. Right. Yeah, but who is important? I mean, one of them is priority. So they all build off of each other. We, it, like he said, it's, it's strictly a team. So your real estate agent is your direct representative. They are the plug to everyone else. The lender and the appraisal, they go hand in hand, but guess what? The appraisal has the final decision on the value. So, so the lender the is responsible for this role. Okay. Your, your real estate agent, you work directly with them on a regular basis. You search for homes. They educate you on the process. Once you select a home, you go on the contract. You, if you're using finance, unless you're paying cash, that's an option. But if you're using financing, then you're working with your realtor, your a, a lender, and your title company, which we're going to get to that next. And so the lender is handling the finances. They're making sure right. that... You know, your income is what it's supposed to be, your credit score is what it's supposed to be, your escrows, your savings, things of that Can nature. Can I give you an analogy? <laughs> yeah, he likes stories. A, fo I like a football things. analogy. That's a We're all into football? <laughs> okay. Yes. You're the quarterback. Okay. You're the buyer. We can't do it without you. Uh -huh. right? right? Think of us as your real estate agent, kind of like your head coach. Okay. Your lender is kind of like your offensive line coach or maybe your quarterback's coach or something like very hyper special. Right? Then you have your title company, your home inspector. These are all little coaches on the sidelines. Yeah, but they are, they behind the they, lender. They the appraiser are. is the referee. Yeah. The appraiser is kind of like the middle ground trying right. to keep the rules. Blows the whistle. They do. They, 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 can, they, they, they can make, they can change the deal. Yeah. 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 And you'll never know your appraiser. Yeah. Um, no. I would say less than 50% of the time does the buyer's agent get into contact with the appraiser maybe sometimes the seller's agent gets into contact with the appraiser but typically the lender orders an appraisal at random that person is assigned to your file kind of like the referee on the side of the football team or the side of the football field you don't know who's going to show up but you know the visiting team and you know the home team that's what we're building 
due to bad behavior years ago, yeah, we, we can't have a whole bunch of communication with the appraiser. Yeah. yeah. It's just some bad behavior yes, years ago. Just yes, years ago. Silly question, but is, is it ever happened that the, when the, the appraisal happens, they find out the house is worth more than what you put the offer in for? Yeah. Then you go, yay! Because I'm buying a house so and I'm already in trouble. No. Mm -hmm. So, so um, that's the good part. When it over appraises, it's okay. to the buyer's benefit. So you're walking into this contract with equity in your home. Got it. Okay. It's only when it so under appraises that we get concerned. So they can't go back, like the they can't go buyer back. can't go back and say, oh, no. actually we want to. Okay. Well, the they can. There's more to that. I know there's more to that. But it very rarely doesn't happen. It very rarely doesn't happen. The seller doesn't even know what the house appraised for. Right. The seller never gets to know. Because remember, the buyer oh, pays for the appraisal. Only the buyer. They should have put that on here. The buyer pays for the pays for the appraisal. So it's actually your it's your appraisal. So. Sometimes sellers just, they never know what the house appraised for. They just want to make sure they get what they agreed to in the contract. Again, your agent should be doing what's in your best interest. There are things that you can do if the house over appraises. Um, I want to lean on the agent that you choose to represent you to do that for you. It's a little bit too convoluted to kind of explain. Yeah, Do you have a question? Yeah, I think I, you said an assessment and an appraisal are different. Are what, two is, different things. what is an assessment? An assessment, actually, and I'm going to speak the speak false form, an assessment is what the city uses to determine our taxes. Oh, so they use a, they use a ratio. Another umpire. Uh -huh. yeah, right. They use a ratio and they say, well, you know, based off of the last value of this property, we use, and the ratio is the same depending on city county, and they use that, and then they determine an assessment, and the assessment determines how much your property taxes are going to be. That's mm, a whole other mm, place, guys. Mm, so they're not coming out and like because I think on Zillow Rep, and I've seen, in the, like, there's a section where it shows you the assessed value. Yes, yeah, so so houses are reassessed. Is that like the city did, they thing have a cycle the where they reassess properties. Another thing that triggers, and we got to get back on another thing that triggers a reassessment. Especially here in Baltimore, is houses that have been fully have been renovated. Mm -hmm. So then your contractor pulls permits, and it says to the city, "Hey, we pull permits. They doing some upgrades to this house. They added a fifth bedroom. They added a, another level." And so the city's like, "Oh, okay. So permits were pulled. I need to go back out and reassess this house." And so, and at that point, the taxes will probably increase. So you'll never own property in the city. You, you will absolutely your house own if you pay your if you pay your out. Job, the uh, ground. No, that's, that's a different, different conversation. Yeah, the assessment is just your tax. That's a whole different conversation. Oh, well, huh. and, and, and I'm going to be honest, right now with me, if I'm, when I'm working with buyers and we're buying properties of ground rent, I'm, I'm actually advising them to redeem the ground rent or either put it in a contract for the sellers to redeem the ground rent so that it goes away. We, we're trying to get rid of ground rents. Mm -hmm. I don't I know that we ever will, but we're trying. <laughs> They going into some whole other stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it though. The questions are this great. This is where you're going to go into a rabbit hole. Yeah. yeah. Title search is going to be what ensures short version that the seller actually has the right to sell you the property, right? The history of the property, the transfer of ownership, ensuring that this seller has the right to turn to turn over the ownership to the buyer, and that there's no liens or encumbrances that you're going to inherit. So a simple way to think about it is. You don't want to inherit a, a code violation. You wouldn't want to pay a bill for a code violation. You wouldn't want to inherit um, an alley paving assessment, right. which I had a buyer that came up during a title search. Title is very unsexy, right? Who's the least sexy person on a football team? That's what the title person is, right? But they're very, very key and they get the property transferred. This is the legal transfer of ownership. Title company comes involved at the early onset, and then they're the company that actually processes the ownership transfer. So settlement, when you buy your property, is conducted by the title company. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Nobody this, ever has questions on that. In the state of Maryland, you have the right to choose your own title company. Yeah. There's also going to be something called owner's title insurance that the title company is going to ask you to pay for as part of your closing costs. Um, I highly recommend owner's title insurance because owner's title insurance is your private little attorney in the event the title company did miss that mm -hmm. that lien or that, that 
you know, something that was left on the property from the previous owner. Um, in addition, the title company is the person that holds all the money. Oh, so all the money God. goes to the title company and they disperse it out accordingly based off of your closing disclosure. You had a question. And what criteria would you suggest we look at when choosing a title company? Fees, because they're all different. There's no standard. So you want to look at the fees. Um, of course, the customer service. Your real estate agent and your lender have these relationships, so they're more than happy to recommend them, but you have a right to choose. And most people just, you know, want to work with the title company that seems friendly, knowledgeable, and affordable. You only deal with them during the transfer of the property, then you don't That's work it. with them. Yeah. Right. I, I would encourage you that the real estate professional that you trust is going to have someone that they recommend. Unless you get really off-putting vibes talking to that person, I would... I would go with that. Even if they're a little bit more expensive than another option that you could have gotten online, the experience is gonna be a little bit better, the cohesiveness, and you want to go to work Monday through Friday, text your real estate agent and say, I need you to reach out to the title company, they're asking me for this. And your real estate agent goes, yep, I got you, because these are my people. Not like, well, you chose this title company, so, right? You're building a team. I can't reach them. That's important because you yeah. want the relation. All the relationships should be cohesive, if possible. You had a quick question. Do you have time to look? Is it your responsibility to look up the title company or the realtor? We will absolutely. If you if you say I don't know any title companies, we absolutely will give you a list of them. And we have preferred ones, like he said, where we have relationships <laughs> where we can pick up the phone and say. You know, I'm working on this transaction. I need direct assets to make sure we get everything done for my client while they're at work. Yeah, and if you really wanted to, there are some title companies here. I don't know exactly who it is, but I do believe in Live Baltimore. I think it's a great resource. You could ask those kind of questions to them. It's not because yeah. even though it might not be my preferred title company, if you met them, you had the opportunity to talk to them, and they're here, <laughs> they know what they're doing, yeah. right? So, because she's having my real estate telling me they provide different services. And she said, like, um, one time the seller was like dead ridden, so the title company had to like go to the person's house. They did. And like, they did. mobile delivery free. Yeah. They did. Yeah. I'm like, I, I, I make sure title was. So, no, that is. So, that, that could be a benefit. That could be something um, that you say, well, I want to make sure that my title company is, is within, you know, 10 miles of where the property is because I want to make it convenient when it's time for us to meet there to do the final closing. So Nick, you have a right to choose, but this, so I, I mean, I'm still building new relationships with title companies every, every month. You know, I meet new title companies all the time. So no, you, you, you'll be fine. Um, you either have a family member or something to refer title company, you're more than happy to use them. Any other questions on that? Financing. This, we can talk all day about this, but we're going to tackle it. Your lender begins the process of underwriting. So again, you sign your contract, we send your contract to your lender and to the title company of your choice, and the lender starts diving in like, why did you just deposit the $500 cash in your checking account? Where did it come from? Um, so that's called underwriting, and that's where the appraisal gets ordered, they're checking your income, they're making sure you're maintaining your credit score, making sure your reserves are in place. Um, sometimes, I don't know why it takes 30 days for it to happen, and a lot of people can get it done less than that, but generally, your underwriting process is about 30 days, 30 to 45 days. If you guys are using these grant programs, it's gonna be 45 days. So that that's the only period of time we should be using like cash up and things like that. It's only three months. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. But before you sign that contract, because remember, we're in contract in here right now, but before you, you should have had those conversations. It's something that takes place in what I call my bias consultation. Like, I'm drumming it in as your real estate agent. Then you're going to hear it again from your lender. So, 45 days? I'm sorry. You can't use cash up. So, you can't buy nothing. So, so, so let, me, let me say, let me say, it's highly recommended, but if you understand why we say that, it, it makes a better understanding. Because if I can afford the house, I can afford the house. But when you get underwriting, they are verifying it, so they want things to remain consistent. And so, 
if you go out and buy a new car, right. you may still be able to buy your house, but that's a conversation you need to have because they it's based off of your debt to your mortgage your proof is based off of your debt to income ratio. So I mean there's some people out here who can buy a house and a car at the same time. But it's is you know in some cases people can't because again it changes what you were pre-qualified or pre-approved for in the very beginning so you just have to understand why we say don't have cash deposits because the federal government wants to know if you um, are selling drugs or doing something illegal and you're making these cash deposits into your account and this money is going to disappear so you're not going to have the money to go to closing in the first place I hope that wasn't too wrong for you guys, but I'm pretty no, 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 no. true. So that's why they, they want to know where these cash, that, or they want to know, did you get a loan? That's the biggest the one. They right. want to know, where did she get this, right. he or she get this cash money from? Did she just go get a loan? Okay, we're running outside. Did she just go get a loan? And so now that means she still owes somebody else, which means they get into fee and her paying back her mortgage that we probably buy her for. Yeah. So you got to understand why we say don't do those things. It's highly, highly recommended that you don't because you want to remain, remain consistent throughout your underwriting process. Mm -hmm. So I thought she said you can't use cash app. She like did you say that. Send somebody Sorry. money through cash app. So, so you want to limit it. So limit. yeah, yeah you want to limit it because they're going to want to know what's going on. They want to want to know if you have another job, if right. you have another income, do you owe other people? Right. And it reports to the credit bureau. But everybody's situation is different. Mm -hmm. So you make sure that you have that conversation with your specific right. lender about your specific situa financial situation. Cash Just like every good mess. religion, yeah. we yeah. have Ten Commandments. Yeah. If you haven't gotten one, yeah. come get one yeah. before the end of the day. Yeah. But the Ten yeah. Commandments essentially say don't open up new lines of credit. Don't start yeah. anything new. Don't change anything. If you use Cash App every day, keep doing what you're doing, but don't accept twelve hundred dollars, eighteen hundred dollars. You need to you need to keep living your life the way that you live your life. Well, tell her she's gonna starve for a month and a half. Is that better? Like I guess your if you have funds available. And again, it's specific because if you got you know you got fifty thousand dollars sitting there and you only need five for it, yeah, they're not gonna care if you take care of your daughter. But again, everybody's situation is specific. So when you start your process, you have that conversation and your financial situation choice is, is it can rock the boat though. It can make the underwriting feel nervous. So when you say uh, verify your income, they're not looking to see if you maintain a thousand dollars. In fact, they just want to see that you consistently spending. They're going to do. No, no, they want to. They're all of that. They're going to do all of that. They want to make sure that your income is what you say it is. Because we can say whatever we want. I heard you have to have dollars a dollar in your account. They want to see stuff like that. Well, it depends. It depends on how much house you're buying. Because they want to verify that you have closing costs and this these things. But like, okay, so you. You get paid two thousand every two weeks, so you gotta pay bills. So you're not gonna consistently have that two thousand in there. So if you get down to two, three hundred dollars before you get paid the next time, you that messes up. So it, it depends. Is it, you know, because I want to know get verifying your income what they do. Look when you write your offer, uh, yeah. I'm gonna say to you, you wanna, you've already pre-approved this house, <laughs> and we, I'm gonna send it to your lender and say, hey. Mr. Johnson, whomever wants to buy this house, tell me how much his mortgage payment is going to be and how much money he's going to need to close. That's you're not going to touch it. And there's something called reserves, but it gets really technical. They're going to say you need to keep this amount of money in the bank. So yes, pay your bills, but they're going to already know that. They're going to know what your monthly income is. They're going to know what the mortgage payment is. And they, they use a ratio to say you know based off of your income and based off of your liabilities, this is how much money. Ratio, with the ratio, this is how much money we think you can afford to buy a house. So we're going to stay within that guidelines. But you're going to have to pay closing costs. Right, so you should have some savings. That's what we come up with grants and stuff for, right? Yeah, so, but the grants so, don't cover everything. Well, we know that. We know we FHA, that you can't, you, yeah. grants don't cover down payment. They cover closing costs. Right, so. right, right. I'm, I'm just saying, but I mean. But sometimes. Well, remember. The buyer. Your lender is going to verify your income, right. your assets, and your history. And sometimes they're going to look at it all, finish, one and then they're going to tell you what you would qualify for. Right. You shouldn't have to worry about paying okay. your electric bill. You got bills to pay. Right. They're counting that in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what I want. And they're not just looking at what's on your credit. They're looking. They know that you still have to live. Right. Yeah. And then you also have to make that decision as well. You might say, Yeah, they qualified me for five hundred thousand. 
but I know that I shop or I know that I'm <laughs> going to buy a new car or I know that I take multiple vacations a year. So instead of me paying for that $500,000 mortgage, I'm going I'm to I'm opt to do three fifty dollars or four hundred. dollars So you, this again, experienced agents, experienced lenders can lead you down this pathway. It's important that you have that relationship and you have these conversations prior to writing a contract. And I have a question too. Yes, ma'am. Isn't sometimes the seller will help out with the closing cost Absolutely. and, and yep. the other thing? That is a negotiable item yep. in, in the process of the contract. You, you can ask for seller help and the seller has a right to say yes or, or no. no. Yes. <laughs> So real quick, want to run through home insurance, yeah. but I also want to hit kind of closing off the transaction too. You know you're going to get home insurance. Yeah. You got car insurance. You got home insurance. If you go through the same company, sometimes you can get discounts. Insurance is going to cover you in the event of a major failure. So a fire, rain, other kind of major failure. Flood is not a standard insurance policy. Just beware. But again, your real estate agent should have people that you can talk to or consult your car insurance company, right? right. Um, let me go to the next slide. Yep. No, I keep going. Oh, you want to go? We only got so much time. Oh yeah, this is important, right? All right, perfect. Yeah. What's up, dude? Oh, mm -hmm. closing disclosure. Closing disclosure is your final submachine. The, uh, the trade law says that buyers have to know what their interest rate is, what their loan amount is, what their monthly payment is, which consists of principal interest and escrows, and how much money they'll need to close. That's your closing disclosure. The lender provides it. You get it close to the end of the transaction, right before we go to settlement, so you can verify that your interest rate is what you thought it was, your payment is what you thought it was, all the fees that we talked about are included on there and you know what they are prior to signing on closing day. Read closely to verify the accuracy, ensure that you don't have any surprises at closing. It's okay to ask questions. Maryland law says that you have to review this three days before you go to settlement. So you will get your final closing disclosure three days before you're required to sign because you have an opportunity to, so you don't have an opportunity to review it. You want to add to that? No. And guess what? You see everything on there. You see everything. If, if you All skip your fees. To settlement. If it's not on there, you don't have to pay it. <laughs> if you skip the settlement, I think yeah. there's another slide in there. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, okay, there's a part two. Nah, yeah, keep going. <laughs> go, 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 go. I'll hit it. There's one slide. Keep going. That one. That. Okay. All right. So we've only got a couple minutes, so I wanted to make sure we hit this. So you guys, we talked about home inspection, appraisal, title, financing, home insurance, right? We hit closing disclosure. We didn't talk about the walkthrough, but essentially, very simply put, the walkthrough is at or closer to settlement five days. So two, three, four, five days prior to settlement, you're gonna walk through the property just to make sure that it's materially the same thing that you intended to buy. The seller didn't flood the basement, there's no holes in the walls, Use the, the rental car method, a hole smaller than a silver dollar, right. a scratch smaller than a dollar bill, right? Like, that's what your walkthrough is. And at closing, we're going to knock out all of this. If you remember, we just talked about the closing disclosure. We're going to review that closing disclosure again to make sure that our numbers were as we anticipated. We're going to make sure that we've wired the money to the seller, or I'm sorry, to the title company, so the title company can pay the seller, transfer ownership, record the documents, the deed of record, and then again, distribute the funds to the seller to make sure that that actually happens and it's not on you. Now, as we say, you're gonna take the keys and congrats, you own a home. It really is that simple. But to circle back to a comment that you made, is the contract copy and paste? It is. I, I downgrade our job all the time. You're never gonna find another realtor that says that. It's so simple. The difference is how you do it and with what diligence you're taking, right? Are you going to be the person that just throws the numbers on the page or are you going to do your diligence to what the property would appraise for prior to submitting an offer? Are you going to be the person that just says, ah, the title company will figure it out? Or will you know that it's a ground rent property before your buyer submits an offer? Are you going to be the agent that says, hey, go to Geico or whatever your car insurance company is or 
will you have a home insurance company that's reputable that you trust to give your buyer advice? And that's the difference between two agents, not a plug and play contract. Exactly. But your agent's biggest job is structuring all of this to happen. And you say by agent, what you mean, the realtor? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Your realtor's biggest job, right? Yes. Because um, ultimately, we're going to bring in these people, these coaches, the offensive line coach, the quarterback's coach, the running back's coach. Each one of those is a person on the left side of the page, right? So that you can do what you need to do to execute. Yes, ma'am. It's like when you start from step one, is there any way to ever get out? So once you sign in any of those steps, what is the consequence? The simple answer is yes. yes. If there's a problem, you ask the seller, they say no, you get out. If there's a shortage in the appraisal, you ask the seller, they say no, you get out. If there's a title reflection that comes up, maybe impacting the seller's ability to sell, you ask the seller, they say no, you get out, right? If you don't qualify for your financing, you get out. So it's always if, then, you just don't have the right to go, I'm done. And that's just up to three days before closing, you have that right, if I understand correctly, right? Yeah. No. I, I, I thought that after, you, you get three days before the closing day, you can't get out. So you get three days to review it. No, you just get yeah. random. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. People say that quite often. I'm not sure. You don't get that contract. No. All right, so there's two opportunities that the buyer has the unilateral right to terminate, right? Right? One, I'm not going to say this because I don't want to, but... When there's a legal right to do so, there's one. The second... I was hoping you said it. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> the second is if the seller says no. That's the key. There are legal rights to do so. An example of this is if you buy in a homeowner's association or a condominium, you're going to get documents, and you have the right to review those documents, and upon review, I don't want to live here. Okay, you have the right. There's a couple of those opportunities. But if the seller says no, you now have rights. Aside from that, you signed a contract three days prior to settlement. If your closing disclosure doesn't look like what your lender told you it was going to look like, you're going to yell at your lender, and they're going to make it right. But unfortunately, that doesn't give you the right to bail on the seller. And you get your money back. Um, I would never say that. <laughs> but my girlfriend not always the case either. Because I would, the lady didn't want to do what she had to do and I so she got her money back. I would a, never say you'll get your money back. What I would say is if you choose to terminate the contract, according to the contract, you have the right. My job is to tell you your rights. Right. But we do have to get the seller to release those funds to you, and it's possible that the sellers just Republic. Oh. Oh. Mm. But it's, it's your agent's job, your realtor's job, to educate you and help you make that decision. We don't want to walk in thinking, oh, well, up to three days before settlement, I can walk away. It's got free. We want to walk in thinking, I'm good. You guys want to sell me this house in three days? I'm happy with that. Right? If we go in with that mentality, these little ministerial pieces, become worst case scenario, right. not the objective outcome. And that's why it's important that you understand your contract. So we're today we're talking about if you're on the contract. It's important that you understand your contract going in because then you'll know what your rights are from the very beginning. Well, then what about the doing property um, as is? Like I think it's about property as is. There's just right. a thing. Cash. You just, no, it's not cash. Cash. You, just need, you just need to understand what that means. Yeah. And, and it means that you know you just can't you just can't back out, out of that because of the home inspection rather you can't use the home inspection as a reason. Well, can you, you, can't, you can't get out of here. No, Why you want to get out? I thought you wanted to buy this house. <laughs> no, there are some. There are, he just mentioned the yeah, thing. Yeah, but you think there's too much of repairs. It's, so that is that is the home inspection. That's where you negotiate. If the seller says no, then you can say. You can say no as well. Okay. Also, I really want to respect everyone's time. I know we're over. If anybody needs to leave, yeah. 
But I'm here. I know Monica's always here for a good question. If you guys have questions, you're more than welcome. But, go ahead, Liz. Um, so you all probably might know this before I came in, but um, the course that you have to do in order to buy in this city, like the whole certification thing. The home ownership. Yeah. How long does that last? Because I did it over a year ago, but you never, one year, one year. Exactly. yeah, they never signed me, like the, yeah, so if you signed. talk with, thank you so much, if thank you talk you. with your counselor, they may, they may find some exception if it's not a long time, um, so speak with, um, I mean, Missy or Jordan out here, because I do know it, if you did it through this long, I know it expires after one year, there are some times, where you, um, where they will give you an extension, but if it's if you're like five six months out, but you got to all over again. Oh. If I remember correctly, you don't get the certificate until you sign a contract. So you do your one on one. Oh. Oh. Right. Then you have to sign a contract. And they I was told I don't get my certificate yeah, until I sign a contract. Yeah, that's right. And that's, 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 they don't even really send it to you. They'll send it to the lender or us. Yeah, I sent some kind of documentation because once we were done, I sent like a piece of paper over it, and I never heard anything back. So I wasn't sure. I mean, I'll just go through a different. And keep in mind that the Baltimore houses a lot of opportunities for grants, and they all have different rules. But I know collectively you have to do the home ownership counseling mm -hmm. and the one on one before you sign a contract. Oh, so y'all out here, I've had some people out there that out here looking, and they're like, yeah, I'm waiting. I'm gonna write a contract tonight. And I was like, well, you better finish your one on one first because yeah. you will not be qualified for the grant fund. Yeah. So again, that's that's working with a very educated and experienced, knowledgeable agent so that they can advise you accordingly. Thank you. You're welcome. Congratulations on y'all fix your home. I'll talk to you later, agent. Okay. Okay.